Greetings, everyone. My name is James Prysock, and I'm the director of the Office of Social Justice and Activism here at Audubon University. Today, we're going to talk about inclusive leadership, ways that you can filter through your identity, and ways that you can get engaged uh, to help influence you to be more of an inclusive leader. Some of our highlights today are going to be reflecting on your personal identity, life experiences, and how they're represented in different contexts and spaces. Consider and discuss with your peers, students, and families differences of identity and life experiences. Help you to better navigate cross-cultural dialogue and engage in intentional, authentic interactions. And also summarize some of the stuff we have going on at Otterbein University that you can be involved in. So first we must start at identity. And really this boils down to three major forms of identity. We're looking at people's personal identity, their social identity, and their universal identity. So personal identity is just the things that make you, you. Those things that help make you unique in that sense. Your social identity is looking more on who do you have shared experiences with. And it could be a group such as a fraternity or sorority, a team, uh, your classmates, being an Otterbein student in the, you know, overall, it could be a religious group, it could be race and ethnic, ethnicity, uh, any of those things. And universal identity is how do we share this space as humans, uh, knowing that there are some commonalities as humans that are um, on earth and are working and getting an education and just trying to make the best of life that they can. So I want you to take a second and think about your own identity. Think about those things in each of the bubbles. What is your personal identity? What are some factors with your social identity? And how do you feel about humanity as a whole? What are some human commonalities that we may have? And how do you feel about humans in general? Our perspective of, of humanity often dictates how we navigate our different spaces. For instance, if you have more of a pessimistic view of humanity, that can help shape the way you encounter new people or how comfortable you are in new environments. So take some time to think about that. The reason why these things are all important is that one without other or two without the third you get a very incomplete picture and an incomplete perspective of people in general. For instance, if you, so, if you focus solely on the individual pieces, you miss where people may be labeled into groups and have those shared experiences, whether they be positive or negative, and you may miss out on our universal connection as people. If you focus entirely on the social, you may end up stereotyping people because you're saying, okay, I feel strongly about the social when it comes to this. So if I meet someone, I'm going to group them in here. And so I guess all of these people are having the same experience. So you're neglecting the individual pieces. And universal is you risk of dismissing ways that people are different, the things that are making you you, and minimizing the different experiences of others, both at the group and individual level. So really, when people are usually unhappy in a space, it's because they're not being recognized in at least one out of the three categories. So when we meet someone that may be of a different culture, our brain automatically tries to put pieces together to help us make sense of who this person is. And so it could be someone of a different culture, someone of a different gender, sexual orientation. It could be any of those things, really. And so when you're looking at it, you're saying, well, okay, this makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. I've seen this before. I've watched this on TV before. Okay, now I think I understand. But when you do that, there's a risk of you being very wrong in your uh, conclusions and your puzzle pieces that you're putting together. So it's very... Uh, important that though that may be our first reaction that we're also taking a step back and saying you know what 
my conclusions can actually be wrong. Let me connect with this person and I'll, I'll you know, be able to put these pieces together based on my interactions with that person. And a lot of times we don't do that effectively because we're afraid to get proximate with someone. So we make these decisions of before we even have connections with this person, even before we have conversations with individuals. So remember that all three of those things are very important to all of us. And when one out of the three is not being recognized, that it can lead to, to problems because people want to be seen as a human being. They want to be seen as someone of a group that they are a part of. And they also want to be seen as an individual because they bring unique characteristics and beliefs to the table. So for an activity, one of the things that you could think about is how conscious am I about myself and my identity as I matriculate through the different spaces of my life? For example, think if you were walking alone at night, would you be afraid? Now, that could have a couple of factors attached to it. That could be maybe based on your gender, or it could be based on where you are at the time. You know, if I'm walking around in a neighborhood that I'm not familiar with, am I walking on campus? And those things can help influence our decisions. Now, not everyone feels that way. And so there are going to be some differences. Um, if you're looking at, um, are you able to, if you, if you have a partner, are you able to show affection to them in public without fear of being ridiculed? So, so a lot of times, um, people don't th even think twice about holding hands with their partner or giving them a hug or, or a kiss or just being close to them. When there are communities that have to think about those things and saying, you know, if I do this, there may be some repercussions from it, some social repercussions. People may be laughing or staring, uh, making inappropriate jokes. That may happen. And, and so I, it, it takes having conversations with people to understand that because sometimes that's not a part of our personal world. Uh, but I've, you know, I've spoken with several members of the LGBTQ I plus community and some of them are like, yeah, it took me a while to get comfortable or I, don't feel comfortable doing this at all, uh, you know, depending on who my partner is and where we are. Uh, think about your, real, uh, if you have religious beliefs, um, are they being recognized by your employer or by the school as days off of work or holidays? So think about different religious beliefs and how they're not being recognized as holidays and days off. So a lot of times we get to spend time with our families, if we, you know, go along with Christian traditions when it comes to holidays and celebrations. Uh, and for some of us that have celebrations outside of those, those major observations, then we may not get the, the time to be able to do those things. And then we're trying to work out, hey, can I still turn this assignment in on time and acknowledge my beliefs? Uh, how do you have that conversation? But how do you also be knowledgeable enough to pick up on it and say, you know what, not everyone may share this same thing. How can I be flexible uh, in a reasonable way to make sure that people are feeling uh, comfortable and, and heard within this space? And those are just one of many things. This is Identity Will. Uh, I, I love this because it comes in various shapes and forms. This one is, is, is really straightforward. Uh, so I, I selected this one because you look at all the different categories you have around, and these are a lot of the things that help make us, us, from your socioeconomic status to your religious spiritual affiliation, your age, ability, your first language, uh, all those things help encompass identity. Where privilege comes in is, what are those things that you think about the most often? And what are those things you think about the least often? So one of the things that helps is that if you take some time to think about, you know what, I think about 
my gender most often. Okay, now why is that? Is that because you are uh, one of the only people that identify with your gender in a given space? Maybe you're in a major dominated by another gender. Maybe you're in a class uh, dominated by another gender. What are those things like? So sometimes you may be very conscious of that. It could be, uh, it could be race or ethnicity. Maybe you're one of the few students of color in, in your spaces, whether it's your residence hall or your classrooms, your uh, co-curricular activities. Any of those factors can, uh, can happen and really push us to be conscious of that part of our identity. Other times we may think about things very, you know, least often, at least often we may not think about them at all. For instance, one of the things that I don't think about often enough is my ability level. So when I'm approaching the building, when I'm not thinking about is there proper access to the building necessarily. I'm not thinking about, okay, there has to be an elevator here, or there has to be a ramp, or there has to be braille so I can be able to read the signage. Uh, I'm just really looking at, is the door unlocked? You know, so uh, other people have other filters as they are approaching uh, a building or an establishment. So that's something that we take for granted. Uh, I spoke with a lot of students and uh, they're looking at our residence halls and they're thinking how many of our residence halls don't have elevator access. Uh, and so it doesn't really kick in for some students until maybe they have a temporary injury and all of a sudden they have to get to the third floor uh, of a residence hall, third floor and main hall or something like that on crutches. And uh, they're thinking, wow, you know, what if I had to go through this every day? you know, that is not um, very inclusive because people can't get from point A to point B. Now here's some keys to leadership in general because all of these things help fuel our decision making. And as leaders, we are making so many decisions in a given day. We make them for ourselves personally. We make them for the groups that we are a part of. And some of those things can coming to fruition where they're influencing policies or procedures that are affecting a lot of people. So what some of the four, the, the four keys are time management, uh, looking to be able to, to balance your responsibilities. It's so easy, uh, especially as an Otterbarn student, to be involved in 50 different things. And uh, you get pulled in so many directions, it's hard to say no. Sometimes. Uh, but it may be more beneficial for you to say no. And, and just think, I instead of doing 10 things, maybe I'll do three things, because I could do those three, three things extremely well. That way I could focus my energy properly, my time and effort, and, and that will help me make good decisions as well. Taking initiative is the big key, is sometimes we don't feel confident enough in our own abilities to be able to um, make an impact on something, to make a decision on something. And when leaders are developing, if they're able to get into a space where they're like, you know what, I don't have to be told to do this. I see that there's something that needs to be done. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to find out, okay, what exactly needs to happen here so I can make an educated decision on my next steps. Starting in your role. So sometimes you are going to be the primary person, the people that, the, that others go to in situations. Other times, you may be in a support role. And so I've seen it where some leaders are very comfortable with like being the go-to person, but when they have to take a step back, it's harder for them to let go of things. And they still feel like they have to have their hands completely on the situation and control the situation. When actually there is someone else within that group that has a stronger skill set in a specific area that makes them more appropriate to be the leader in this circumstance. So a great leader is someone that can recognize and say, okay, I have the best expertise in this, so I'm going, I'm going to lead this. Or, you know what, there are some other strengths out here that would be much better for this. 
So let me, let me create, make sure there's a platform for that person to step up and then I'm going to support them in the way that they need to be supported. So that's starring in your role, whatever that role may be. And then lead on and off of your very uh, area of involvement. So we represent our areas of involvement, even when we're not doing things for that area. So if it's a team, you represent um, Otter Barn softball, regardless if you're on the, the playing field or not. You represent uh, being a Cardinal Corps leader, whether you're actually in service mode or not. Uh, you know, you, you do those things, you're on 24-7. So anything that you do can help, um, can really shift how people perceive you in a good or bad way. And so a lot of times when people aren't conscious of that, it ends up putting a stain on the entire group. And then now that group gets stereotyped for not being inclusive or uh, not getting things done properly, just because maybe one or two people uh, misrepresented the group. Now we're gonna go into some leadership styles. So there are so many forms of leadership styles. I just uh, separate them into six different categories. So I'll briefly go over those categories. Number one, you have pace setting. So the pace setting leader expects and models excellence. That's the do as I do now. So they're going to, um, you know, kind of show you what needs to be done. It's a really good way to get quick results. If you're on a tight timeline, a pace setter is really good at helping to get people to that finish line in time. However, some of the, the, the negative of that is that it could squelch innovation and people may not feel comfortable speaking uh, up to, to uh, put in, have their input into whatever is going on with the group. Authoritative leader is, also has some good qualities. It's the come with me. If, some, if you know, a company needs a new vision or a group needs a new vision, Authoritative leader is often a leader that people like to follow during those circumstances. Um, you know, when there's no ex when explicit guidance isn't required, uh, often these people are very enthusiastic and have an entrepreneurial spirit, but it's not the best fit if you're not the most knowledgeable of a about a situation um, in comparison to another group, another person in the group. So that's what we talked about being able to say, okay, you know, I don't know the most in this situation, but this person does. So let me help empower this person. Because you're not going to follow someone that you know more about um, a particular situation than they do. Affiliative, affiliative is a people come first. They're really good with the emotional uh, bonding. So if a group is going through stress or some type of trauma, uh, they need to rebuild trust. They need a charge. Uh, an affiliative leader is really good at this because they are uh, projecting an environment that has a lot of uh, praise and, and affirmation. Sometimes if this is overused or used in the wrong circumstances, it could foster mediocre performance. Uh, so the group may not feel conf confident in their direction or they may not be performing at their uh, optimal amount. Coaching. So this is to try this person. So this person goes in and says, okay, I see that you're doing this and you're doing this well, keep doing what you're doing. Hey, you're trying to accomplish the same thing and it's not working, so how about you try this and let's see what happens. Okay, that didn't work, well, let's try this. Um, that's, that can be very effective because sometimes people get to the same place in different ways. So some, someone that's able to help guide them throughout their differences, whether it be their differences of learning, their different abilities to get to that same outcome, that's awesome. And coaches are really good about getting people through those spaces. Uh, it could be ineffective if people are, are not willing to listen to that person or the coaching style leader lacks proficiency in that area. Coercive. So coercive gets a, a, a bad rep in, in all situations, but it's not all bad. A coercive leader is someone that you need that, say, that says, hey, this is what I need you to do, so do it. Do what I tell you to do. This is really effective in crisis emergency situations. 
So if you were in a crisis situation and you need decisions made quickly, a coercive leader is the perfect person to help lead that. Uh, for instance, if there is, if you're in a classroom and there may be someone that broke into the school and is wanting to harm people, a coercive leader will say, okay, you lock the door, you cover the windows, uh, you call 911, we're going to barricade the door. Uh, okay, let's all grab something, um, you know, to project, to defend ourselves. You know, that is the person that, that you will want in that situation. At that time, you don't want someone that's going to say, all right, everyone, let's take a vote to see what we should do. You don't have time for those things. You don't have time for that. Uh, so it could be avoided in other situations because really the chorus of leader doesn't give, but usually doesn't give space for people to be creative and for people to be flexible. So then others aren't going to feel uh, like their voice even matters in the situation. Uh, the democratic leader is the what do you think person. So this person is really good about getting input from their team before decisions have to be made. And so it's important that as a democratic leader, if that's you, that ultimately you're going to be in a position where you eventually have to make the decision. Uh, and so sometimes leaders will depend too much on what other people think. And they're afraid to make the ultimate decision at the end of the day. Uh, for those of you that watch The Office, Michael Scott could be that leader at times, you know, so if you're, if you have to fire someone, you can't go around asking people who you think should be fired and then put it off on other people as well to make that decision and announce that because you don't want to be looked at as the bad person. Uh, so you have to be able to do both. And it's not a good person like we talked about before for emergency situations. So if you need quick decisions, you're in a very tight timeline. Uh, you need someone with a, uh, with stronger uh, decision-making skills in that particular moment. So now think about which style do you identify with the most? What is most salient to you? And inevitably, we're gonna have pieces of these different identities, or at least a few of them, but there may be a default mode. So think about what is your default mode? What is the style of leadership that you identify the most, you're most comfortable with? One of the things that I personally would love everyone to be able to do is have very tough conversations. Whether you're in, on a team, in a um, fraternity, sorority, in a company, tough conversations could be something that people shy away from. And when that happens, things just kind of fester and they build and build and build. And a lot of times that ends up in something that's very bad. Someone ends up quitting, someone ends up getting fired, uh, you know, someone's mental health is in a very, very bad state. There's a lot of friction within the group. People are arguing because they're afraid to have that moment of discomfort. So they sacrifice that moment of discomfort for something that's actually going to be worse than if they would have just addressed it in the first place. And uh, it's very easy to shy away from that. But just as if you're on a team and you know someone has a task that they're supposed to complete or you know the team is depending on them to do this well and they don't a lot of times people have no trouble saying hey we practiced this and you needed to be there and you weren't there and it threw the whole playoff and threw our whole chemistry off but they wouldn't say that to someone who they saw um you know committing microaggressions or um, you know, cursing someone out, uh, making racist remarks or homophobic remarks, then that person may shy away and not say anything at all. And it's important that we're able to do that no matter where we are and say, okay, I need to be able to address this some way, somehow. I need to bring attention that this is wrong so we can have a moment of discomfort. And oftentimes through that moment of discomfort, the other person or the other people involved will be like, oh, I didn't even see it that way, or I apologize, that was messed up of me to do that or to say that. Uh, there's still some salvageable qualities if you're able to address things uh, appropriately and in a timely manner. 
And that's where it comes to things that may not even affect us directly. So we, we advocate and um, are allies for, for other people um, that may not have the voice or the ability to say something themselves. Uh, and there are, there's a spectrum for this. And, and really, we, ultimately, we like to get from a self-interest standpoint to a social justice standpoint. Because self-interest is really just doing it because you feel good about it. Like I'm doing service because it makes me feel good. I connected with this community because it makes me feel good about myself. Altruism is like you're dealing with guilt and you separate yourself from the problem. And, and, and so we're not perfect. So separating ourselves from the problem could be very dangerous because then it really um, detracts from our self-awareness because you're saying I'm doing something for people instead of with people because I'm the good one and I'm not part of the problem. When we all make mistakes and we all have perspectives that can be harmful to others. But we have to be honest with ourselves to be able to see that. Uh, because if you, if you don't and you end up doing service and doing things for you may end up you know, for, further harming the situation or the people involved. Uh, so we're really looking at this from a social justice standpoint is saying, you know what, this is part of a larger picture. Uh, so for people in self-interest, it may make you feel good because you're helping someone that you really care about. So maybe it's a, a friend of yours, maybe it's a family member. And so that's, that's great that you're, that you're wanting to help that person out. When you get to a social justice lens, you're looking at it in terms of, hey, this person is not the only person that's going through something. Uh, they're not the only person that shares this identity or is impacted by this policy. So this is part of a larger issue. So how do I work with uh, that population to help influence what policies and procedures are out there from our government, from our university, from our uh, student organization? Uh, because that this impacts all of this, uh, even though it doesn't directly impact me, it indirectly impacts me. And so if I care enough, I have to be able to see that. These are just some, some tips on being an ally, just kind of how the mental process goes, is you have to be able to understand your privileges and how others may not have the same ones, going back to one of our activities. Understand the systemic issues that are affecting marginalized communities being willing to st step back on issues and really let people use their voice, whether it's creating a platform or just simply listening to them. Not listening to respond, but listening to understand. Intervening in situations where appropriate. So if friends or family uh, are perpetuating these negative things, how do you hold people accountable, even, if, even those that you really love? So it's easy if you don't have a relationship with someone um, I joke all the time and say, you know, for the cable companies or the cell phone providers, people yell at them a lot because they don't really care about the relationship. Uh, but when you care about the relationship, it gets much harder to be that person that intervenes and says, hey, I don't like what's happening here. Um, what you said or did is extremely offensive. And even though it's not about me, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Or maybe it is about me and you don't know it. And it's making me feel uncomfortable. And those are extremely hard things to have. Uh, and so if, if, if you see those things, think about how you may approach that situation. One thing that I'll do is I'll say, ouch, out loud, when someone says something, even if it's not directed at me. And it, it gets people's attention. They're like, why did you say, ouch? Then all of a sudden, I have their undivided attention. Uh, so when I have their undivided attention, I'm going to say, hey, you know, well, you said or did this. Um, this is how, this is what I think about, this is how it made me feel, and uh, I don't appreciate it. And I know there's people out there that would definitely not appreciate that. And in educating yourself on this, you're just being inquisitive is going to really help things because you don't always have to be educated by the person that is going through a situation or that identifies with a particular uh, identity. There's a lot of good literature out there. Uh, you're going to be uncomfortable, angry, embarrassed, guilty, and defensive. Those are completely normal emotions to have. 
um, as you're learning about others and the things that are affecting them, as you're learning about yourself and the things that affect you. But it's not having those emotions that's issue, it's what you do with them. Do you allow those emotions to impact you in a way that is very destructive? And are you attempting to really authentically understand the identities around you? Are you having authentic conversations with people? Are you putting yourself in spaces where you're not the majority? So you can have an opportunity uh, to learn some things and understand some things that you may not have known before and I may not even thought of before. So it's really about challenging, challenging the paradigm. We're all coming from a lens where we spent 18, 19, 20, 21 years uh, with a belief system and we're developing those things and now we get put into a university where we have to share spaces with others that are bringing their paradigms to the table and sometimes those paradigms butt heads and they conflict with each other. So being self-aware, knowing that your perspective is not the only one, and it may not even be the most accurate one. Like I said before, being inquisitive and seeking opportunities to educate yourself and then sharing accordingly. So don't, don't keep all the cool stuff to yourself. Be able to say, hey, you know, this is what I learned. I think some of my friends or I think some of my family members are gonna find this useful. That's how you get depth to the lens. And there are several ways to do that on campus. To share a few things, here's just a list of student organizations that we have in our office that you, know, you can find out when they're meeting and uh, my information and, and uh, assistant director's information is at the end of this. So you can contact us. Uh, we have a lot of identity-based organizations under our purview that you don't have to be part of that identity to be a part of the group. It's really that, where this is where the educational aspects of the group are going to be focused on and this is where most of the members are going to are going to be comprised of some of our staple programs that we do throughout the year um, you know our office works with uh, domestic and international students so we're really here to serve the entire campus community and there are several things that you can be a part of uh, that are really talking about diversity and inclusion in different ways, whether it's socioeconomics, whether it's body image, whether it's environmental justice, all of those different things. There are several campus initiatives and, and many of you may be very familiar with um, a lot of the service uh, components of the university and all the great things that are happening there, such as the Promise House. Uh, we have a diversity and inclusion committee that students can be a part of. Uh, you just show up to a diversity and inclusion meeting and, and so that way you can kind of find out what's going on around campus and help you bring the student voice to the table as well. Uh, we have Eng English language learners uh, a program so sometimes you know English isn't people's strongest language and so we have programs that are helping uh, students with that. Uh, we have international student experiences so a lot of times we have stereotypes about what are, what's going on in other countries and how people in other countries are. Uh, we get that vision a lot from, from our media uh, and, uh, and many times it's, it's not the complete picture or it's not even an accurate picture. And so taking the time to really get to know people from clear across the world is extremely beneficial to be able to, to deepen your lens there. Uh, we have Otterbein Deaf Culture Club, so that's another thing is looking at uh, communities that are communicating in different ways, you know, are, um, do you know basic sign language? You know, Spanish being the second language of the, of the country, do you know some basic Spanish? Just in case you run into someone, maybe you'll be able to at least do a little bit of communication. Mm -hmm. uh, Braille and transcripts. So think about, you know, if you're, if you're making things accessible to people, it'd be nice if for you to have some braille or at least a document that could be converted for someone who needs it. Uh, so looking at, you know, are, are you, what programs are you working out of? Okay, can I convert this to a PDF and send it to this person? That way their um, translating machine can, can make sure it can convert that to braille for them. Access points. If I'm creating uh, an, an environment or having a program, and am I looking at, okay, is there an elevator in this space just in case people need it? Think how many orientations that we've been through and where people end up in the campus center and have to get upstairs to the cafeteria, to the Cardinal's Nest. You know, so th think about if 
you're in a wheelchair or you have mobility issues, how do you get upstairs? Really, you have to go into the scary freight elevator, which is not meant really for people to go in. It's the freight elevator. It drops you off in the middle of the kitchen, uh, and then you have to find your way to the cafeteria. Um, so when that building was constructed, that piece wasn't thought about within the construction, saying, okay, how can I make this much easier for people to get from point A to point B? Because if most of us are able-bodied, we may take that for granted. And then looking at... Uh, mental health or any type of situation where people are communicating differently and in a different way or maybe understanding things in a different way and how there's a spectrum with that. So I just put autism as an example. Um, that's one of many. But looking at how we categorize people even within that and autism is certainly a spectrum. And so treating everyone with autism exactly the same way is not going to be beneficial but finding out where that person is, how they're understanding things, how they receive and give information is really important. But that takes your effort to be able to understand that. Pronouns. So not everyone is identifying um, as he or she within the he, she binary. Uh, so with that, it's gonna come uh, you know, other words that we should incorporate into our language to be able to identify people. And no, we're not gonna know that from before we really get to know someone, but it's the, the, the fact of being open and saying, oh, okay, this is new for me, but I'm, I'll, I'll get the hang of it. You know, I may make, mis make mistakes sometimes and I make mistakes too and I end up correcting myself. But a lot of times people, they're not expecting perfection when it comes to this because they know it's gonna be a little different, um, but they expect effort. And, and so it's up to us as caring individuals who we are looking at each other as humans that we recognize that there's a social identity uh, of, of, a, a, of a community here, the LGBTQIA plus community, and within that community there are individuals that would like to be identified in different ways. So that is a, a good example of looking at the three layers of identity. Uh, so really putting effort into there. These are our social media handles. So if you'd like to get uh, in touch with us or see what's going on, we update things all the time. Uh, when we have events or programs or just a thought of the day, just to kind of get, get us reflecting on ourselves and the world around us. So thank you very much for tuning in. And my email is at the top and the assistant director, Rebecca Nelson, she works with international students. Her email is at the bottom. So thank you very much and um, look forward to hearing from you all very soon.